This is New Home Insights, the John Burns Real Estate Consulting Podcast. I'll be your host, Dean Worley. As the title promises, we're going to bring you insights into everything housing. The latest trends, innovations, observations, and issues of the day. We'll bring in colleagues here at John Burns and also some major industry players from all across the country. This podcast is going to be quick, fun, but also hopefully make you think. So see you here every couple of weeks. Now let's get to it. Welcome to New Home Insights by John Burns Consulting. I'm your host, Dean Worley. Today, we are going to discuss the apartment world, apartment development. We're going to talk about this from the standpoint of the market, for sure, and cycles, but also with a view toward demographics and demand in apartments and going forward. So today, I have two of the very, very best in the business looking at apartments. We have Leslie Deutsch and we have Ken Perlman, both just happened to work with me at John Burns Consulting. Please say hi to the folks and give us a little introduction. Leslie, why don't you start? Okay, thanks, Dean. Thanks for having me on. Uh, my name is Leslie Deutsch. I'm a principal here based in Florida at John Burns Real Estate Consulting. And I split my time. I do a lot of for sale residential analysis, consulting jobs, and a ton of apartments as well. So I think we have a real a real interesting uh, conversation to have today about the apartment market, and I'm looking forward to it. Thanks. Absolutely. Ken? And I'm Ken Perlman. Like Leslie, I'm a principal with the group. I'm, uh, I'm based on the West Coast. I'm in San Diego, California, uh, and I spend most of my time traveling the Western U.S. And like Leslie, uh, I spend a lot of time my time working on the for sale market, but also looking at apartments in the multifamily market all over the country. Right on. All right. Sounds good. Are you guys ready? We are ready. Yes. Let's start with the big picture stuff. So just give us your overall thoughts on the apartment market, and especially in terms of this cycle. Do we still have some play left in this cycle? Or are things heading for a reset here? Well, I'll start. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thanks, Dean. Oh, no, I, I, think, uh, I think the apartment market has a lot of room to run, but I think that this particular cycle that has benefited so many apartment developers – uh, building towards millennials as they started to rent apartments is is all but ending. I think there's a lot of, of millennials in their 30s starting to form their households and need more space and move into more houses or, or for sale, um, sorry, for rent single family. So I think this next cycle that we're looking at is going to look a lot different. So I think there's a ton of opportunity, but the opportunity is to shift the product and shift your target renter to what it used to be. Totally agree. And you know, when we talk about where the apartment market has grown, really it's those those buyers that we call the sharers, those people that were born in the 1980s. And the apartment space over the over the rise has really been concentrating on those sharers and as Leslie said, we're seeing younger families now seek out more attainably priced homes for purchase in their in their market. And so as they move into their family formation years, we're seeing things like the rise in the, in the single family for rent, uh, build for rent space, and just a shift in who our apartment renter is. I think we'll start to see uh, more of the younger renters, those connectors, uh, people born in the 1990s. And I think we're going to start to see some older renters, uh, more of the, uh, the move down active adult renters. Uh, who are running by choice, kind of the uh, the demographics of that barbell that we talk about. Yeah. So are we are we heading toward? I mean, how are we going to target? What what are apartment developers and uh, going to have to do differently to start thinking about these new? I don't know if that's the right word, but these new types of renters. I I think they're going to have to look very differently at what they've been building. So they they've been building what you can fondly call is an amenity race, right? That very high-end apartments, luxury apartments with just amazing amenities. But but now you're going to have two different renter types, as Ken alluded to. You're going to have the younger renters, which are saddled with student debt, which are striving to get jobs in the marketplace, and frankly, don't have their parents to help them out to um, to pay their rent. So they're going to look for more affordable. So I think develop, apartment developers are going to have to start considering no amenities or very minimalistic amenities and start thinking about different types of units to build, uh, those that are either really small and can be affordable or bigger, capable of handling roommates. Um, but the other end of the spectrum you have is you have the 55 plus renters. And, and like Ken said, these are renters by choice. They're going to the one thing that they're going to want more than the other is a little space because they still have stuff that they need to store 
and a uh, studio apartment probably won't cut it yeah. for them. So again, it's different configurations and different, uh, slightly different amenities for them. Are those folks, I was just going to say that, are, are those folks still looking for amenities? So there still might be, at least for that sector, some amenity race going on, but a different amenity set. It is a different, uh, it's still a bit of an amenity race. And a lot of the amenities that you're, that you're used to in the conventional apartments are, are there. You know, you're talking about, um, you know, pools and fitness facilities. But a lot of it is convenience. It's places like it's, it's uh, people to receive packages when they're not there. It's to take care of maintenance. It's, mm-hmm. it's really kind of the people, the older renters, those move down renters, are really looking for convenience of lifestyle. You know, there was a big article from a uh, survey that the National Multifamily Housing Council, Council did on why people rent by age. And really the top two reasons why those move down renters rent is because they're looking for convenience and flexibility and they want to avoid maintenance. So anything that is associated with that is, is what they're after. Convenience is everything, isn't it? And it is. it's funny you say that because uh, um, parcel lockers. I just Huge. did a study, a, a apartment study in the Bay Area where, you know, you have – and um, I had two – independently, two separate leasing agents tell me literally they're ready to quit if their management doesn't get parcel lockers in here because they're somewhat older apartment complex, older than the late 90s. And and so it's just become a wave of packages. And so parcel lockers are, are becoming critical. Is that is that fair for, for all sectors we're talking about? I think so. Yes, I agree. Absolutely. The Okay. So so we're talking about kind of the demographics of apartments. You still see some play in this cycle for apartments, but kind of counter to that, or at least sort of a counter argument is we have seen this huge, huge amount of construction in the apartment world over the last several years. I mean, almost every market has had a, a, a lot of new construction in excess of historical averages. Do you think that the apartment mar- market is oversupplied generally or any, any specifics? I'll start. I, I think that the there's two things going on. In every market, there's been a ton of construction, but I think you've got to really delve down into which submarkets and which areas have seen that construction. So once you get down into that, I think there are markets that are still undersupplied, but certainly markets that are seeing some oversupplied. Um, also, it goes back to the type of product they've built. There's been a lot of the same product for, for very good reason. There was a lot of demand for a specific type of product. So it may, it may be oversupplied on, on a specific product, but there's room to grow on different apartment types for sure across most of the markets. Is that going back to the relatively affordable kinds of apartment complexes? Affordable, but but also ones with larger units for for uh, fifty five plus. So there's there is that luxury, and and fifty five plus generally does have a large amount of money to spend and saved up. So I think there's still opportunity for real luxury apartments, but maybe maybe a slight different amenity set, um, a, a little bit more social activity and um, larger units. Like I said, how are you, Candy? Think that oversupplied, undersupplied, right supplied? Um, I, I think that, yes, I think as Leslie said, I think there is generally the, uh, the danger, the concern that many markets are oversupplied. I think, you know, look, when you look at rent growth across many of these markets, and I'll look at some of the markets that I cover, Las Vegas, uh, Phoenix, uh, Denver, you know, rent growth year over year, effective rent growth in some of those markets is up six, seven, eight percent. So effective rent growth is good and the job growth is good in most of those markets. But what we are starting to see is, the occupancy rates are dropping in most of those markets. Not not a ton, uh, you know, one percent across most of the markets, and most of them are still hovering around that ninety five percent occupancy. But there is kind of this notion, and we can see it in the statistics that we are starting to kind of reach that that critical mass or that that point where uh, we don't have a lot more room to expand on maybe the traditional apartment market. But I think, as Leslie said, I think it's more important now more than ever that we don't paint with a broad brush. We have to really look at our niches in our specific submarkets. You have to look at who your renter profile is, like those move down renters. You have to look at, uh, as Leslie said, um, those uh, those 90s, 1990s uh, connectors, um, renters, many of whom have shown a preference to live with roommates. So does that mean that they will accept a, a bigger apartment um, with, a, with more of a roommate space? Does it mean things like co-living? Uh, does it mean things like, you know, we've seen some of our clients starting to look at the opportunities and the differences between average class A rents in a given market and class B and C rents in a given market. If you look at a lot of markets, 
uh, the difference between the class A and class B and C rents is now is, you know, still 25, 30 percent. Can you take some of those uh, BC properties, upgrade them and still create rents that are more affordable than those kind of class A rents? Now, what I can tell you is we are starting to see a lot of our clients do that. And a year ago, that gap was 30 to 50 percent. Now it's 20 to 30 percent. So clearly some of those B properties that are being rehabbed are starting to push up towards the A's. So you're having kind of class B plus, class A minus kind exactly. of properties that are yep. filling that gap. Because mm-hmm. it really is hard to build into that gap, isn't it? It just doesn't pencil in most cases. It really is. You can't, you really can't, uh, you really can't build um, and lease uh, for what it costs. You know, new construction, yeah. the rents just don't support it. Yep. How about, how about any markets out there for both of you guys? Any markets out there that you, uh, that you like particularly for apartments right now? Yes, depends on what kind of apartments you plan on building. Um, so I think that uh, I, I think there's a lot there. I, again, I, I'm very bullish on the apartment sector. I think there's a lot of opportunities. I think the big growth markets are the markets that are still seeing some really strong employment growth because that's where the young people are going to go and also where the 55 plus are going to go to be with their children. So and those are going to be your renters. So places that we call uh, and we call them new boom towns that have seen massive employment growth. Uh, the Austins, Nashville, Dallas, Orlando, Denver's of the world. Those are the markets that are going that we expect to, to continue to add jobs, which will attract both young and older renters. Now, now to be fair, a lot of those markets I mentioned have seen a ton of construction, but again, it, what I found interesting about the occupancy rates coming down is that when you look at these markets that have had such supply, the occupancy rates are are starting to come down, but that's just because the lease, it, there's been so much supply on the market, it's taking a longer time to, to get the lease up going. So there's a lot more vacant units because you can't, unfortunately, deliver apartments in phases. So I, I think a lot of these markets are still present a ton of opportunity, but again, again, focusing on the different type of renter. So you'd follow jobs and you'd follow these quote unquote new renters. Is that f- yes. Fair to say? Yes. Jobs. Jobs specifically. I think the other uh, the other strategy that can be employed out there is to is to follow some of the good school districts, yeah. even if they are way out in the suburbs, because not all of the people that are moving out of apartments are looking for a house. They might still want to rent, but now they've got children that need to go to school, and some of the urban centers don't provide that. Don't re- at that point though. Don't restray into a, a different podcast, which is to say single family rental. A little bit. How can the apartments? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yes. There's not as many of those as there are apartments in certain markets, but yeah. yes, you, you, certainly that's a more more of a competitor. I would put it. Is that a little bit? Yeah, dangerous? A- is that a little? Hold, one second, Ken. Is that a little bit dangerous then? And say you you're going out to some market where you want to hit those folks you're, you're just talking about, and you say, okay, we need more three bedroom apartment markets to hit those those families. Is it dangerous that you could then compete against single family rental if you do see some single family rental activity come into that that sub market? Yes, to some extent. Single family rental, yeah. especially the newer to be built single family rental, still requires more land than a lot of the apartments do. So, and it, and it is a growing industry, and I'm a big fan of single family rental. Yeah. But the apartment is a little bit more of an established industry, quicker to get those. Uh, quicker to get the zoning and the, the entitlements for. So okay. y- you will always have competition, but you might not have nearly as much as you have in the urban areas right now, uh, just against the other multifamily. So I, I, I think that there's opportunities there for sure. Yeah. Ken, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. you, you don't have to say what you're no, talking. no, that's, no, that's, I think Leslie said it perfectly. And, uh, you know, <laughs> you, you might've been looking for some disagreement on this podcast, maybe more so than we are, but we actually, uh, are, are very I would much love that. Come we're on, seeing guys. on different sides of the country. And, you know, I think it's a different renter profile. You know, we talked about, we started this podcast talking about those sharers, those people that are kind of born in the 1980s and, and really the apartment space has been focusing on focusing on those people. And now they are starting to move into their kind of family formation years And they're starting to look at, well, how are my needs going to change? And that's what started to either push them into home ownership and looking at for more technically priced homes or into that single family rental space with larger bedroom counts and uh, in better school districts or, uh, you know, nobody living above them or below them, private yards, that kind of a thing. You know, I still think, you know, going back to originally when we were talking about 
uh, where the, the apartment market is hot. And I totally agree with Leslie on, on the concept of the new boom towns, the San Jose's, the Austin's, um, the Denver's. I mean, even some of the markets that you don't think about, like Salt Lake City, I mean, if you look at it, the cost of owning an entry level home in some of these markets is dramatically higher than even renting uh, renting an apartment. So even in, for instance, in Salt Lake City, which you don't typically think of as a an over overly priced uh, market, although it is, um, as you don't think of it as a, as a typically as a market where affordability is a challenge, it's still one hundred and twenty six percent more. Uh, the 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 owning versus rental premium is still one hundred and twenty six percent, which means it costs 126 more. Uh, it costs 126 percent more to own an entry level home than it does to rent an apartment. And so, when you look at some of those markets, San Jose, San Francisco, Orange County, Salt Lake, uh, Seattle, Austin, those new boom towns, it's still renting is still a substantially uh, more affordable option for some of these people than than buying an entry level home. Okay, so so affordability then is an issue that, in a sense, if I if I hear right, that that kind of helps the rental sector versus the forest sale sector, right? It's it's a it's a, a bolsters the rental sector. But how do you how do you deal then with uh, an affordability in the rental world too? We're just talking about how difficult it is to build relatively affordable new rental product. So as as even that that ratio of income to rents rises higher and higher in most markets, how do we deal with that? How, where does affordability come into the picture? Oh, that's a one word answer, Dean, roommates. Um, no, no I, that's not the only answer, but but it's true. I mean, that that's one of the- <laughs> You're on record, sorry. That's one way to solve some of the affordability. Uh, the the other way that it's been quite interesting, mirroring what's happening in the for sale world, you're starting to see apartment development in kind of real s- suburban markets. You know the 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 second and third tier markets from the urban core, and there's been a lot of success with that because there are people that are renters by choice or or not by choice that will commute from from an if it's near a highway and it's still a little bit further out there. I think that there's a real positive to that. And I've seen that happen if, they, if it's rent is a value versus living closer to the urban core. So that's that same dynamic that, you know, the mm-hmm. drive to qualify or something like that, that pushes for sale world out to secondary or tertiary markets. The same things happen in the rental world. Yeah, I see that. Uh, I'll give you a great example in, in Miami. So there's been a ton, thousands and thousands of units have been built in downtown Miami and Brickell Avenue and, and all over South Beach and, and the beaches. But now that that development has started to move way west and, and really further out in places you wouldn't necessarily consider, yet if it's near a highway and it's commutable to work, they've seen huge lease up rates and really strong success with that. So people will give up living in that urban environment just to be able to rent in a, in a brand new place with new amenities, but at a huge value to the downtown. Downtown Brickell could be $3 per square foot and, and a suburban Hialeah could be a dollar dollar ninety. And so that's a big difference. That's worth having an alligator in your pool. <laughs> I I'm pretty sure that's a thing. So as I say from California. That's an amenity. That's okay. Okay, they name it. <laughs> the home builders are experiencing affordability challenges. We're seeing costs rise for apartment developers. Uh, as well. And so I think that uh, apartment developers are dealing with some of those those same challenges. And Leslie talked about rebates, uh, and that's one good option. Those 1990s connectors that we're seeing in the apartment space now don't mind roommates. And I think as we talked about previously, you know, co-living is another, this concept that we're seeing mostly in more urban areas of, you know, shared common spaces like kitchens around individual units. Uh, We're starting to see more and more of that. We're talking with more and more developers uh, about that concept. And then the last one is, and I know Leslie talked about this as well, and I would agree, is location and really looking at moving outside of that really city urban core and really looking into more suburban locations or even what I'll say to use our Burns term, suburban locations where we're seeing new apartment communities with great amenities, maybe some good access to services 
uh, certainly access to transportation. And renters are saying, look, this is a great option to save a little bit of money, particularly than, you know, uh, particularly over living right in the middle of downtown. And I think um, there's an example in, in North County, San Diego, in a, in a community called Pacific Islands Ranch, which is for all intents and purposes, a suburban community. Um, but there's a lot of apartment development that's going on there. Um, it's got great access to the freeway. There's a lot of employment nearby. Um, there's some shopping there. There's a Trader Joe's. And, and some of the renters are saying, I want to be in this location. I want to be close to these services. And hey, this is a little bit more affordable than living say downtown for for leslie though is one of the drawbacks for suburban apartments is of course the alligator in the pool for for you do a lot of work in tech that's why i do not live in that's why i don't live in florida <laughs> I, I, like, I will, I, that's why i don't yeah you do a lot of work in in texas is the main worry mm-hmm. there uh, stray bullets i'm assuming <laughs> Is that a concern? I will not disparage, I will not disparage my friends in Texas, uh, so I will decline to answer okay. on the grounds that that could incriminate me. But thank you for that. Okay, so you caved. You completely caved. Okay. So now, if I'm kind of flip the coin, in the for sale world, we've seen some builders go with a very affordable for sale product. Do you see some of that as being competitive with and a threat to apartments in some markets? Yes. And I don't see the apartment developers paying enough attention to that. So our, our, fortunately, we've been on both sides of the, the coin here. We, we sit on the for sale and the for rent side, which is unusual for, for any consultant. But, and it, but it gives us this advantage to see that every builder has, well, not every builder, many of the builders are really starting these divisions to appeal to these yeah. these sharers born in the 80s that are looking for a home that are, it's a little bit more affordable. So we see these large public builders, well-funded, starting these divisions, trying to get people out of apartments and into into homes. And and it's been working. It's been working in a lot of markets in the Southeast, for sure. Um, And it's one of the last things that apartment developers tend to to watch is is that move out because it's been so long since that's been the case. But I think that that's happening really all over. And I, I think it's gaining momentum. Yeah, I, I would say yes, and I, you know, I, I guess I'm a little bit wary of using the term threat, but clearly, it, clearly, it's something that apartment developers need to be aware of. I mean, you know, you see the rise of groups like uh, Starlight Homes, which is a more attainable division of Ashton Woods and Dr. Horton's Express Homes, and then of course LGI, yeah. um, who is a great builder, and they're pulling. Uh, their buyers right out of the rental market. And it's really they're helping their buyers understand how the monthly payments are in in owning a home are really comparable to to renting. So I think that from the renter perspective, um, yes, it's certainly something that the uh, rental developers need to be aware of and need to be watching. Um, I think there's a couple of things. First of all, the monthly payments are comparable um, or can be comparable in some instances. Um, it doesn't, you know, home, home ownership also comes with a down payment. Uh, and in some instances, it's challenging for those who are renting to come up with a down payment. Um, but yes, I see that as a real threat. I also think that, you know, when you start to look at who has supplied the rental market historically, or at least over the last couple of years in this up cycle, you know, a, it, a lot of the rentership has been from those people that were born in the 1980s, those sharers. And those people are now starting to say, hey, look, I'm starting a family. My composition has changed. My lifestyle has changed. And I want to start looking for a place where I can kind of change my lifestyle and raise my family. And the easier that a builders are do uh, are making it for those renters to move into a single family home, I do think it's a threat to the so apartment is it, market. Is it still sure. a situation though where, like I said, the main uh, a motivator for folks to get out of apartments is life stage, and maybe the main motivator for folks to come into or stay into apartments is is it fair to say that's amenities and and that lifestyle that they can enjoy there. I think that's exactly right. But, you know, I think that, um, you know, lifestyle, amenities, uh, ease of maintenance, uh, those are all of the motivators in uh, in apartment renting. And then, of course, there's still that economic aspect of having to come up with a down payment. Um, and when you, you know, live in some of the more expensive markets in the country, we've talked about markets like 
California, Southern and Northern. Um, you look at markets like Denver or Nashville. Uh, those are not inexpensive markets. And so there is an economic uh, issue to deal with there, which is, hey, I might, I might want to change uh, how I live uh, from a lifestyle perspective, but I may not have the economic means to do that. Um, and that's one of the places where we're really seeing the rise in the, uh, the build for rent space or the single family for rent yeah. space. Okay. Especially with the student loans weighing them down. Do you see the apartment developers sort of fighting back a little bit? Let me, let me explain. So sometimes you, and some of this very, very affordably priced for sale product, they'll make overt appeals to renters. They'll literally say something like, oh, you know, you can build equity, et cetera. And this is so much better than renting. Do you see apartment developers sort of, um, counter? Act, counter arguing those points. Oh, there's hidden costs to owning a home, things like that. Do you, have you ever seen that in any markets you've worked in? Um, yeah. So, I mean, like I said, renters are moving out to, to purchase homes, but there's, there's no doubt that the cost to own a home is still more expensive than renting in most markets. Um, we've seen a lot of markets across the country where owning a home is significantly more expensive than renting, uh, literally a 70% plus premium. Um, and those are the markets that have experienced a lot of growth. We've talked about the new boom towns, your San Jose's, your Austin's, your Denver's, uh, and some of some of those markets. Um, so I think that as we as we look at it that way, I mean, I think the cost of ownership is still more than the cost of renting um, in a lot of markets. And I think that that's one of the ways that builders are or, or that apartment developers are kind of combating um Builders, and then I think the other thing is, is that you've talked about uh, amenities and lifestyle, and it's gotten to the point now where um, rentership is really about lifestyle. And when you look at those buyers or those renters that were born in the 1990s, uh, those connectors, a lot of them uh, prefer to rent for really ease of maintenance, um, where they want to live, living with roommates, and the overall kind of flexibility. Leslie, how about, how about you? While the apartment developers do some great things about attracting people to the rents, I don't think that they're doing as much as retaining them. So what I've heard on the apartment side is great ideas of, of concessions and getting people into apartments by catering concessions to certain people, free gym membership to this person and a free, um, you know, a, a free uh, card to Whole Foods for this person, depending on who you are. So they do a great job getting people in, but not necessarily uh, retaining people. So a lot of the renters, they're, they're moving for space mostly and layout, but they're also moving because they're tired of their rents going up every year and not being able to budget for that, not, not knowing how much their rents are going to go up. Um, and, and how that's going to affect their budget. So, you ever heard of anyone locking in max rental rates as an as an inducement to 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 control those potential rising costs? No. Max max appreciation. I, I mean, I really haven't seen that. Yeah. I mean, there are clearly advantages to longer term lease rates, um, but I really haven't heard of anybody locking in longer term. Now, as we start to see programs like YieldStar that really are, are able to create um, rents based on availability and timeframes, we're seeing rents change based on longer term rents or shorter term rents. So I would say that that's kind of the, the most uh, – consistent that we've seen in terms of a, of a lock-in, uh, a max rental rate. But I, I really haven't seen anybody locking that in for a long period of time. Gotcha. gotcha. Uh, let me take you back a, a specific question about the 55 plus. You've both talked quite a bit about this, this barbell renters and how there's some opportunity there for older renters. Let me ask you, what differentiates those older renters from older homeowners? Is it just peer affordability or what, what other kind of factors differentiate them? From older owners, yeah. Well, you know, older older Americans are you know are increasingly choosing to rent, uh, particularly those equaler parents, those people that were born in the 1960s, those younger baby boomers, and multifamily developers are designing apartments to target these renters primarily in um, kind of those urban areas, those urban. Uh, with urban density in the suburban market. So the product typically features higher level amenities and larger unit sizes than the product targeting younger renters. 
Um, and as you look at rentership rates for people between the ages of 45 and 65, um, there really is a spike in, in the population between the ages of 45 and 65 that rented in 2003. About 21% of the population between 45 and 65 were renters in 2003. Today, that's 27, 28%. Um, and so they're really renting out of convenience and to avoid maintenance. So think high features, high amenities, high service, right? People that they, you know, um, concierge services, people to uh, receive packages, people to do maintenance. It's really that ease of service that that renter is looking for. Is it, is it like a lot of the younger renters, you know, they want to stay mobile. I know younger households aren't quite as mobile as maybe the, the bias is, the thought is among, among a lot of folks, but our older renters, especially these more, relatively more affluent older renters, is, is that that mobility motivating those also, those folks to be renters? Absolutely. I, and I think that's a great point, which is, you know, those renters want to be, they want to split their time. They may want to spend um, part of their time in warmer weather clients during uh, warmer weather climates uh, during the winter. They want to travel. They want to, you know, We've talked a lot in this podcast and in previous podcasts about kind of the new amenity is experiences, right, Dean? And people getting out and doing things, going on trips, uh, cooking, um, lifestyle. And so these renters have started to realize that they want their lifestyle to be about experiences and renting helps facilitate that. It it doesn't keep them tied down to a home. They don't have to. Uh, they don't have to maintain a home, and so they do. They choose to rent because they can be mobile and they can travel. They can go visit kids. They can. It really gives them a massive amount of flexibility. Yeah, and then they still have time to figure out what they want to do when they, you know, more truly retire, don't they? Right, or or not. Or not right? yeah. they just. <laughs> Leslie, how about how about you in terms of the uh, differentiation from renter, older renters and older homeowners? Right. So, so there's there's so many of them, right? Fifty five plus. We've got ten point two million of them over the next ten years. Additional. So there's a lot of reasons I think that they're renting over buying, but everyone's going to have a different choice. I I, I think. I, I agree with a lot of what Ken said. It, it is about flexibility. Some of it's just affordability. Some of it's they want to be near their children while their children are working, and and some of it is I'm I'm not old, I'm not old enough to buy my last home yet, so I don't want to put money into a home. I think I'll just try out a few different places first. I, I find it fascinating that I've, I've spoken to numerous apartment developers that have built buildings recently, you know, close to, to grocery stores or close to what we call suburban type environments. And they've been surprised at the older clientele that they've gotten, the older renters. It's completely different from what they expected. But just because of the floor plan layout, it happened to be bigger units than they originally wanted, but that's what really attracted them. So I, I think trying to figure out exactly what they're looking for, definitely flexibility and convenience. It has a lot to do with the amenities as well. Uh, and location is a huge one, but there, there's a lot of different reasons. And I think probably the number one reason I hear all the time from from these consumers is I don't really can't really find the house that I want right now. It, it, there's not really a house in that location, or the home prices have really gone up, and and I just want to take a few years and and experience something different. Yeah, so they're not going to settle at yeah, that age. No. Okay. God, you guys, I, I, oh, you know, Ken, Leslie, by the way, just texted me and said something really terrible about you. So your response? About your me? Response? I don't have a response because I am conflict diverse. I, <laughs> I think that, uh, <laughs> I, love all, I love all people and I think Leslie's fantastic. Wow. Okay. You know, that, that's the real, that's the real Ken for, for listeners out there. That absolutely was, was crystal. <laughs> there was no sarcasm in that at all. <laughs> I was crystallizing Ken Perlman. Um, I'm trying to get some uh, contrast here. Some, some- let's get, let's do a couple of quick hits there to finish up. So if you were to build an apartment building today right now all else equal would you choose an urban well i guess not all else equal would you choose an urban or a suburban market given what we've talked about i i would do a suburban and that probably is a little bit of a surprising answer to you but i think that um and maybe i'll even hedge a little bit and say suburban yeah. right and, and really it's about creating the uh affordability that people desire 
You can create the amenities that people want in suburban environments um, and looking for unique opportunities to uh, create those apartments in spaces that are uh, that are walkable to services and amenities. So, uh, you know, I, I, I would say generally suburban, not to say that there's not great urban opportunities because we are seeing them um, in different parts of the country, um, particularly uh, higher density, um, more uh, affordable urban opportunities. But generally, if I were building an apartment today, I would probably look more suburban than urban. Okay. How about you, Leslie? I would say the same. I was going to say suburban, but I'm trying to think of a reason for urban so I can argue with Ken. Um. <laughs> yeah, argue, argue. Come on, man. Say something. Ken, that is ridiculous. And now, now let's go. I, I think, no, I think I, I would say suburban, but I'll give you an argument for urban. I, I think that there's going to be a, a very strong demand for urban product that is either very roommate friendly or um, larger units with with luxury offerings. I, I think that is missing in the urban environments. I think it's it's all. If you take a look, and, and I tend to work in in the southeast markets the most, but if you take a look at all the floor plans that have been built over the last call it six or seven years, it's it's a typical mix of one and two bedrooms with a little bit of three bedrooms. And I think there's some opportunity in those urban markets where the rents are higher uh, that you could really differentiate yourself and find a niche. You know, we've, we've heard a lot about roommates. Are you, do you think that millennials, y- younger renters or even, even um, connectors are more likely to have roommates longer, they're more accepting of that because they do want to spend their money on other things. Is that fair? Absolutely. I think so. A- absolutely. And I, and I think that all goes back to the affordability uh, discussion that's kind of run through this entire podcast. I think they are, remember, they're the connectors, right? They're connected to each other 24-7. They don't mind li- living with roommates. They like that socialization aspect. So I, I would say definitively, yes. They, they need to save that money for Uber and clubbing. I mean- how about uh, where do you see the biggest risk in the apartment in- industry right now? Ten words or less. Go. I'm kidding. You can do more than ten words. Doing exactly ready. Doing exactly what the developer before you did. I don't know how many words. Now, God, that was. I was kidding, but that's good. That was probably less than ten. Ken. And you don't really have to stay okay, that. You don't have to stay that. But go ahead. I, I'll, 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 no, I'm going to count. Okay. I want to stay within the 10 words. So the biggest risk I see is rents that outpace incomes. Rents that outpace incomes. That's yeah. four. Uh, I think this. I think the single family rental space um, is a threat. That's eight, wow. right? And then uh, oversupply. Oh, are you going to use that as one? Um, are you going to hyphenate is, that? Is, no, okay. no, that's one word. So I think if I if I do that correctly, that's nine <laughs> words. So I fulfilled your requirements. So rents that outpace incomes. I think the single family rental space and oversupply. I think are the big uh, the biggest concerns that I would have in the industry today. Awesome. Okay, guys. Well, this has been very enlightening, as I knew it would be. I appreciate it very much. Say, say bye to the listeners, please, both you guys. Bye. Thanks for having me, and uh, I appreciate it. <laughs> bye, and thanks, Dean. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Until next time, this is Dean Worthy with your uh, new Home Insights podcast by John Burns Consulting. We will see you in a bit. <laughs>